great industrial traditions were forged out of steel. Steel making, shipping and heavy engineering, these combined to make Teesside famous. These men have a feeling for steel. It was because of their skill that a new industry came here, which will create a new Teesside tradition. This is what they're going to build. It's the jacket section of an oil production rig. It will weigh 20,000 tons. No platform as big as this has ever been constructed before. The raft needed to float it out into the North Sea will weigh 12,000 tons. Showing what happens is simple, but carrying out the operation will depend on quality and performance requirements no less stringent than those adopted for the Apollo space program. Having been precisely located in BP-40's field, the platform will be permanently fixed to the seabed with piles. Designed by the American company, Brown and Root, the steel space-framed structure will stand 122 meters from the seabed. The North Sea will only allow this sort of operation to be carried out during a brief summer period. This weather window ends in August, so the fabricators had a deadline to beat or wait till the following year. Laying Offshore, a joint venture between John Laying Construction Limited of London and Entrepôt's JTM pour les travaux pétroliers maritimes, ETPM of Paris, were awarded the contract by BP to build one of the first two platforms. The disused ship repair yard beside Hartlepool was chosen as the site for the construction of the platform. The task of preparing the yard was to be a major civil engineering job in its own right. bound wall was built to seal the mouth of the basin and the water pumped out. The sludge remaining was removed and the floor of the basin formed by spreading a one meter layer of sand covered by a one meter layer of slag. To support the massive weight of the jacket and its flotation raft it was necessary for the fabrication area to be extensively piled. The sections of the flotation raft are fabricated by outside subcontractors, both in Britain and on the continent, and shipped directly to the yard, where they are rolled off the pontoon by means of self-powered crawlers. This is one of the largest pieces, measuring 10 meters in diameter and weighing 600 tons. Transported down into the basin, it is transferred onto saddles. The 40 sections that comprise the raft will weigh some 12,000 tons. The raft is in the form of two tuning fork shaped units joined by a series of cross braces. A complex structure consisting of 14 main compartments. These will be progressively flooded through the valves. Each compartment will take about one minute to flood. The company's confidence that many jackets would be built at Greythorpe led to the decision to install removable dock gates. These are constructed between two sets of sand-filled coffer dams and consist of a series of reinforced concrete cells which form the two self-stabilizing gates. The alternative would have been laboriously to dig out the bund wall to allow the rig to float out, then rebuild it to dry out the basin. Now the gates can be quickly floated out and returned to reseal the basin in readiness for the building of a second jacket. There was no precedent for building a jacket as big as this. 
So the engineers had to evolve their own construction procedures. In doing this, they made a decision vital to the efficiency and speed of the whole fabrication schedule. They adopted a big lift philosophy. The lifting capacity was provided by importing from America what was then the biggest revolver crane in the world, and then, to give it extra height, mounting it on top of a specially designed gathered 50 meters high. A crane can lift 720 tons, but some of the loads will weigh a thousand tons, so two such cranes were needed. The first one was built piece by piece at Greythorpe. The second one was prefabricated in Rotterdam, and the 550 ton load lifted by its sister crane. July 1973. The preparation stage is over. There's only a year to go to meet 1974's weather window, so the task of constructing the jacket must begin in earnest. The first piece of the jacket is lifted and travelled by means of hydraulically operated sliding feet to its position on top of the flotation tanks. It is an upper leg section, at 220 tonnes, a small lift compared to many that are to follow. Once the sequence of lifts has been calculated by the engineering methods department, the responsibility for calling up the individual pieces of material that will be needed to fabricate a panel passes to the drawing office. Every piece of pipe which comes to the works is classified by length, wall thickness and diameter. The draftsman looks through the material lists until he finds a pipe of the right size. To form the member needed, it may be necessary to join two or more pipes together, each of which is given a code number. If necessary, the code numbers can, at a later date, be used to trace the pipes back to the steelworks and to the very cast from which they originated. 248, and no, the 48 inch and a half, 40 feet, yeah, it's being offloaded now, it should be on the wagon before midday. On arrival at the works, a visual inspection is carried out to determine whether the pipe has any handling or corrosion damage. Because this one is needed immediately, it is given its code number straight away. Once the initial visual inspection has been made, a more detailed inspection is carried out to determine that the pipe's straightness, ovality, length and thickness are as they should be. Now the pipes are ready to begin the flow line procedure that will take them through the works to emerge tailored for fitting into the jacket. The two tubulars that are to be joined together are set out on bogies to be checked for alignment. The ends of the two pipes are chamfered and cleaned in preparation for the root weld. All pipes, which like these are 42 millimeters thick or over, are preheated prior to welding. The root weld is vital. It must be, to all intents and purposes, perfect. Once the root weld has been passed, the pipe is moved down the line for the next stage of the operation the completion of the weld by the sub-arc welding machine. This is automated welding. It puts metal into the joint far quicker than is possible with conventional methods. The pipe requires an angled profile cut on one end. Again, the pipe is checked, for accuracy and setting out is all important. The angle of the cut is determined by dialing a set of coded numbers, which the operator takes from the drawing issued for the pipe. Once the machine is coded, the whole thing is automatic. Cut to the required length and shape, the pipe is moved into the radiography compound and the world's x-rayed. These tubular sections, cut to precise length and profile, 
form the parts of a geometrical three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. Each is numbered according to the drawings to provide an exact sequence of assembly to fit together into a big section. Down in the heavy prefabrication area, the various pieces are introduced to each other. Maneuvered and juggled by cranes, they're married up with their partners and welded into exact relative position. Some of the nodes, the complex junction points where various members meet, were fabricated at Greythorpe. But to save time, others were constructed by subcontractors in the UK and Europe. Building these panels at ground level, rather than assembling them piece by piece onto the main structure, is safer and much faster. This is where the big lift philosophy comes in. Having fabricated a section on the ground, it has to be lifted, travelled and manoeuvred into place at heights up to 86 metres. Hence the need for the big cranes mounted on their tall gabbards. October 1973 and the organisation of petroleum exporting countries decided to double the price of oil and shortly afterwards to double it again. Now the race to get the oil production platforms into the North Sea had assumed an even greater importance. One of the side panels has been fabricated and is prepared for travelling across the basin to a point where it can be lifted by one of the gabbard cranes. Great care must be taken in the slinging of the panel to ensure that excessive strain is not thrown onto any one of the cranes or onto the panel itself. Positioned beneath the gabbard crane, the panel is tilted into a vertical position. This, rather than the lifting, is the more difficult operation. And the lifting engineers have to make very precise calculations to predict how a piece like this will behave when it is being tilted, as it would be very easy to distort the panel out of its very fine tolerances. At first light the next morning, the lift begins. When the panel is lifted to full height, the crane travels it to its position on top of the flotation tanks. There are many sections to be lifted into place. No two pieces are alike. Experience has shown that the two critical areas in the fabrication of the jacket have been fitting to the very exact tolerances for the welding and fitting for overall dimensional requirements. Tolerances called for in the specifications are stringent. Here the alignment of one of the leg sections is checked using a laser beam. Welding is the heart of the whole operation. The welding standards required throughout the construction of the jacket are almost the same as those required on the fabrication of nuclear pressure vessels. The repair rate for welds on the jacket never exceeded a half of 1% in any one week. An astonishing record, given that a great deal of the construction work takes place across the winter months in conditions often less than ideal. The inspection of the welds is generally carried out overnight, or, as in this case, on a Sunday, when there are few men working on the structure. Identifying numbers are taped round the weld to be tested, and a tube through which the gamma head will be passed is inserted into the centre of the pipe. A rod is connected to the head, and one of the operators winds the radioactive isotope through the tube to the centre of the pipe. The operators then retreat to a safe distance while the exposure is made. Classification, insurance and inspection rests with Lloyds. 
their on-site team of industrial services surveyors work in conjunction with representatives of the engineers and contractors. Because there are so many potential risks involved and the consequences of failure could be so catastrophic, both in human and financial terms, the quality control and inspection is even more exhaustive than it would be for ships. There is the added factor that inspection must be regarded as a once and for all operation because when the platform is in position in the North Sea, inspection and repairs will be made very difficult by sheer physical inaccessibility. The ideal in lifting any large piece is to have to manoeuvre it as little as possible while it is in the air. In slinging the piece, the riggers are guided by very exact measurements provided by surveyors to ensure that the piece is at the correct angle for fitting into the structure. With a job that has to move as fast as this one, tremendous importance rests on the quality of communications between departments. And in this context, communications does not mean endless streams of memos. It means each person having a full and up-to-date knowledge of all the factors which might influence his job. Those factors can change daily. It was to achieve this necessary flexibility in day-to-day -day working that these meetings, held at the end of each day, were initiated. No, I agree, you, you have to start the problem, because we have to put the, the two sphere on the same position anyway. That's right. That's I agree right. with that. Okay. Okay. Hello. We're lifting this Amden Lake 3 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Will you have your crawler driver standing by? One of the 960-ton lower lake sections has arrived at Greythorpe from Emden in Germany. The load, supported by three crawlers, is rolled off its raft pontoon onto shore. To control the trim of the pontoon as the weight of the load shifts forward, water is pumped from the ballast tanks. One of the front two crawlers and the rear single one are fitted with ink wells, large steel dishes which enable the load points a degree of float. This enables the crawlers to turn the load through 180 degrees before it's taken down the ramp into the basin. It is March, and the days are short. With its cluster of pile guides, the leg section is hauled up to its position 80 metres above the ground. that will eventually pin the jacket to the seabed are fed into the jacket structure through the specially prepared guides. Two factors separate the North Sea from other areas of offshore activity. The depth of water that the platforms will be required to work in and the sustained environmental onslaught that they will be subjected to. The so-called hundred-year storm 130 mile per hour winds and 94 foot waves, which the jacket has been built to withstand, are not mere statistical abstractions. Conditions in the North Sea come uncomfortably close to them every winter. The jacket has been designed and constructed to survive these rigorous conditions for 30 years. The more immediate problem is that of getting the structure out into the North Sea before the weather window closes and sinking it to a precise location on the seabed. When Brown and Root tested a model of the jacket and flotation raft in a simulation tank, they found that there was a dangerous tendency during the sinking operation for the jacket to twist in the water. Additional 15 metre diameter buoyancy spheres were fitted to each side of the jacket to correct this and control the momentum that builds up during the sinking.
With the spheres in position, the construction is almost complete. The final details of the float-out are thrashed out at a management meeting. This involves representatives of BP, Brown and Root and laying offshore. Really, the programme represents probably three or four parallel critical paths. You know, there's the structural work itself, the systems work and testing, the preparations for the float-out and the float-out. A critical path of activity leading up to the float-out has been determined. The date has been set. The dredger takes a final run at the deep channel it has cleared. The dock gates have their final checkover. The basin is evacuated of all workshops and materials. But there's time-honoured tradition to be observed. The jacket, to be named Greythorpe One, is to be christened by a special person. Cheryl Patchett, the daughter of one of the men at Greythorpe, needed expensive medical treatment. The men decided to raise the money amongst themselves. Undoubtedly, Cheryl was the popular candidate to christen Greythorpe I. Tradition, then celebration. A party is held for everyone involved in the work on Greythorpe I. The jacket is complete, but even while the festivities go on, the commissioning team are still hard at work. The whole complex sinking operation will be radio controlled from this cabin, which will be mounted on a tender vessel. It's been an endless grind of checks and counter checks. Faults have been found and put right. Still the checks go on. There must be no mistakes. Better minor delays in a dry basin than a disastrous mishap in 120 metres of water out in the North Sea. The sluices are opened, the water pours in. It's a carefully controlled deluge. No signs of erosion to the walls of the basin, so the flood continues. Surveyors check against known points to determine the moment at which the raft floats free of its saddles. When the level of the water inside the basin is the same as that out in the channel, the sheet piles between the dock gates and the sand-filled coffer dams are removed. The gates are then de-ballasted and the guide piles withdrawn. The first of the gates is then towed away by tugs, followed early next morning by the other gate. Everything is now ready for the jacket to be floated out. Three a.m. Saturday, the 29th of June, 1974, and the weather reports are good. The jacket on its raft is slowly winched out of the basin into the Seaton Channel. Tugs guide the progress of the massive structure. Get that man to pick up G1. Yes, sir. Out of the basin, the jacket is taken in tow by the two most powerful tugs in Europe, the Simpson and the Nordsee, for the 250-mile journey to the Fortis field. The Anglo-French partnership at Greythorpe has been a relationship in which each has learned from the other. This two-way process has been the catalyst that has produced a team effort capable of building Greythorpe One in a little under a year. At the junction of the Seaton Channel and the River Tees, the jacket is formally handed over to the client. When oil is finally flowing in late 1975, it'll be only five years after BP's Sequest discovered the Fortis field. Many people, in many organisations, 
in many countries made the achievement possible. None more so than 2,500 men at Greythorpe Works on Teesside. 